Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. We're at Miles College, November 1st, 1995. Ms. Smith, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to come and sit with us today. You're welcome. I want to just start by asking you some questions about your family. Tell me, were your mother and father from Alabama? Yes, they were. Where were they born? What part of Alabama? My mother was born in Birmingham, Alabama, okay. and my father was from Sumter County. I see. Those days they just used the counties. Okay. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Oh, we're blessed with seven sisters and one brother, oh. and he's the baby. And he's the baby, so I'm sure he had a tough time with all those girls. Where, did, where were you in the scheme of things? Were you the oldest, the youngest? No, I'm the sixth child. The sixth child, okay. Um, what about your, your parents' education? How much education did, did they have? My father only finished the fourth grade, but had much wisdom. And he went back at night to community school for a while because he wanted to improve his education. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother finished uh, industrial high school. Mm -hmm. And so could have taught, but she chose a family instead. I see. What kind of work did your, well, did your parents do? Your father, first of all. Okay, my father worked a regular job at U.S. Pipe Company. Mm -hmm. Then he always did some side jobs to take care of that large family. Oh. Selling peanuts, selling paper, picking up dry cleaning, all, and things of that nature, selling coal, all That's of that to supplement the income. Yeah. It was, he Worked on the union and uh, made a statement that he couldn't understand why he had to pay more for his bread than the white man when he made the same amount. When he made more than he did, and when they would get a raise, he just couldn't understand why his raise would be higher because a loaf of bread would cost him the same cost thing. the same thing. Uh, was he a union official? Yes, he, was, he represented the union. He did, okay. Uh, do you know what union that was? Was it the steel workers? No, it was with the pipe shop with the AFL, I think. Okay. Um, your mother's occupation? You? Well, she stayed a housewife for a long time, having children as often as she did. And then she became uh, manager for branch office of a dry cleaning, a social cleaner's dry cleaning mm -hmm. plant. And was, was that cleaners away from home? Uh, First, it was at the side of my grandmother's house where they used to have a business, and they used that, rented that place. And after it burned down, then she moved it in the house, so it became everybody's job. Mm, okay, so it became a family enterprise at a that time. A family enterprise. The social cleaners, was that a black-owned or white-owned business? It was black-owned, mm -hmm. first by Roberta and Lily Bell Honor, and then after he passed, they sold it to the Pippins, to the two brothers, mm -hmm. uh, Pippin. And you had, you, your family had a, uh, say, a branch of, of that, I assume. Is that? That's right. What, that's what it was. Okay. Uh, what community did you live in? I lived in Collegeville. Okay. And at one time, Collegeville was the community of the city. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? That's the where community. my all the. Well, it was a community with the brick houses and with all the other things, the nicer houses and everything. It was a civic-minded community. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're saying that it was a, a middle-class, stable community? At one time. Answer. Okay. Um, what about the racial makeup of the community, occupations of individuals that lived in that community? Well, in that community, we had uh, 
teachers, uh, had doctors, uh, principals of schools. Wasn't that many things you could be mm -hmm. lawyers back in that time, uh, ministers, but we had a good racial makeup. What do you mean a good racial makeup? Well, I mean educational. Oh, okay. Educational, yeah. because the only people that lived there that were not uh, minorities were people that owned stores out in that area, mm -hmm. and they were out there to make a living. So the minority were, were non-black in their community? Yes. Yes, and they were usually what, Italians? Uh... Yes. <laughs> um, what was your community's relationship to the police department? Do you remember? Well, I think one of the reasons the college field started being labeled is because, as I stated, we had a civic-minded community, and they were always going, trying to find out why certain things were happening. So then all of a sudden... For instance, what, like, what kind of things? Uh, are trying to get things for the community mm -hmm. uh, that we didn't have. And all of a sudden, uh, everything that College Via did was in the newspaper. Oh, okay. So Collegeville, you're suggesting that Collegeville then sort of was leading what was happening in Birmingham as far as uh, uh, improving the amenities of the community? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think Collegeville at that point was, you know, was attempting to do those kinds of things? Well, we had the John R. Hatcher Democratic Unit. What, uh, what unit? John R. Hatcher. Okay. And uh, they had a clinic also in their house. Okay. What was the John R. Hatcher Democratic Unit? It was dealing more with voting, okay. basically, than anything else, getting people out to vote. And you can be assured when you turn 18, you were going to vote after things were better and you could vote, uh, Mr. Hatcher was going to see to that happening. Was this similar to the civic leagues that were around the city of Birmingham? Later, yes. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Hatcher sort of led that effort in your community. Oh, he did. Mm -hmm. He did. He led that effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ms. Lula Menifee was with the Federated, Women's Federated Club, so on that side she led. Lula Minifield? Minifee. Minifee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what clubs or community organizations were you a member of, all your, your parents? Uh, they were members of the NAACP, the Alabama Christian Movement uh, for Human Rights, uh, the Federated Clubs. Um, and various church, uh, various church activities. My mother was secretary of various things, and my father was chairman of trustee board, director of the Baptist training union in the church, and uh, worked with the youth, and uh, just a person who would help. If a person needed help, he was just always there for him. So most of the community called him Uncle James. Hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. What elementary school did you start first grade? Hudson Elementary Hudson School. Elementary. What do you remember about Hudson Elementary School? I remember some of the teachers. Uh, as Daddy said, he always knew when we went to Ms. Irons because we had to wear a bow on our head and the boys had to wear ties. And... Uh, there were teachers who were concerned and cared about your education and they didn't let you get by. Mm -hmm. And they knew the people in the community and they knew what your parents expected of you. So you had to do it, no discipline problems. Mm -hmm. That was just out of the question because they knew they could whip you at school and then you go home and get another whooping. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have to deal with the discipline problems like we have today. Mm -hmm. After you left Hudson, what school did you attend? I went to the annex. To what annex is this? Park annex. Park annex. And then had to be there in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And then from there to Parker. Why was there a Parker uh, annex? There were too many people to go to Parker. Okay. 
so and they the, had to have an annex which was back of Lewis, uh, back of Lincoln School. Mm -hmm. So it was near the elementary school. So you went there in the what, ninth grade? Ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And then you go up to Parker mm -hmm. in the 10th grade. Okay. What do you remember about the annex? Um, well, there we had a study hall and the various classes. And I was the baby of the classes, which meant I mm -hmm. left real early. I entered there at 11 years old, which was pretty young. You're into the annex at 11, <laughs> in grade 10, in mean, grade, grade 9. nine. Uh, too fast. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it was, it was different. We had the uniforms we had to wear. You had to wear blue uniforms, and that was the difference. But I think uniforms are great, and I'm glad that some of the schools are coming back to uniforms today so they can stop concentrating on what they're wearing and concentrate on the lesson. Mm -hmm. On to Parker High School in the 10th grade. And Parker, of course, at least those that went to Parker thought that Parker was the best thing that ever happened to Birmingham. Tell me about Parker High School. Oh, Parker High, we, it was nice. We had to walk to the, what we call the special line. And you know we had to pass by schools to get to Parker. Because we couldn't go to Passed the by white schools, white schools uh -huh. in order to get to Parker. Uh -huh. And we had to walk a long ways to get to the special line to catch the special. Uh -huh. But we had fun and we had a good time. And I learned now they didn't have a gym. That was what we needed to use for exercise back in those days. Uh -huh. But uh, we had a lot of fun walking to the special line. It would be cold sometime, but you still remember those days. And if, if they developed fights, it was like, you know, with your fist or a little room, you didn't have to worry about guns and knives back in those days because they just didn't have them. And then they'd be ready to play the next day. But, uh, and then leave the other line and go to park. And they, they had a lot of things to offer there. You had a choice of various things that you could take. So did you get the special line? Was that public transportation? That was public transportation. And you would have to catch that, and then you'd go downtown. Did you transfer downtown? No, didn't have to transfer. It would carry you to Smithfield. Right, to the, to the Not to the door. Put you off at another special line, and then you had to walk to the school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Then we had to walk back to that special line in the evening, mm -hmm. and then get off at the other special line, and then walk home. Were you involved in any, any school activities, any clubs, uh, Speech club. Speech club. Yeah, okay. just very few. Okay. Um, what stands out in your mind most about Parker as a student? Um, I guess the football games, and I know that's the sport area, but um, the teachers caring and their concern and being sure that you learn mm -hmm. all what you needed to learn. But you, of course, I became ill during my school year there, mm -hmm. but I still came out in 51. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Did you spend, take, you have to take any time out of school as a result of your illness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had to take some time out, mm -hmm. uh, but it was only for one half grade. I so I didn't, didn't lose a lot of time, and I was thankful for that. Yeah. Well, you had a couple of years that you could have uh, taken out and still come out with uh, your age group. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, what did you do after, after Parker? After Parker, I worked a while because one of the things I wanted to do was something special for my parents. So I decided to get me some little jobs, and I remember taking this job, making $15 a week. And then I decided I wanted to buy my parents an electric uh, range to cook on. Mm -hmm. And I proceeded and talked with the man. He said, well, your parents need to sign. I said, but they can't sign because they don't know they're getting it. And I don't know whether they checked their credit or what, but he let me have it. And my father didn't know it till I said, you need to wire the house for it. Mm. And he said, but you can't do that. I said, it's already done. <laughs> mm. 
So my goal was to try to do some things for my parents. I felt that they had sacrificed a lot. So I worked for two or three years. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Miami, Florida, mm -hmm. and went to what was called Nightingale College uh, for a business course there, mm -hmm. and stayed there a few years. Mm -hmm. And then came back and worked a while. Uh, so, so you left Birmingham, went to Miami, mm -hmm. spent several years, and then you returned. What year did you return to Birmingham? I returned to Birmingham about 57. Okay. That I returned back to Birmingham. Now, your father was uh, one of the founding members of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Yes, he served on the board. Served on the board. Until his demise. So you then... Uh, was, would have been, your family then was rather active, I assume, in the movement. We were very active. We even housed the guards and made coffee for them. Mm -hmm. And he had one side of the porch. They were already watching from the back. And then when bomb number two went off, they realized they needed to see more. So that's when they closed in a portion of the front porch. Oh, no. And they watched there until Reverend Shuttlesworth left town. Okay, bomb number one. Christmas Eve night. It was a noise like I'd never heard before. And this is a bomb of, of Bethel a Baptist bomb, Church. Reverend Shuttlesworth, really, what, what they was after was him because they put the bomb under uh, where he slept. So they were trying to kill him. And he walked out of that bombing. Now, were you home at the time of that bombing? I was home at the time of that bombing, sitting in the living room. What was that like? What was the experience? And when you looked around, windows were being shattered, and the front door ended up in the dining room, and just no way. You mean everywhere. in your home, across the street from from the parsonage? Right. The the. Bomb, the force from the bomb actually blew the door off of the hinges? Right, and the door ended up in the dining room. What part of the house were you? I was in the living room. <laughs> Tell me, well, how can you describe what that I was didn't know like? what it was. They had never been on a bomb before. Didn't know what was going on. But with all the glass and everything going, I knew I needed to get out the way. Who else was at home? Uh, my children. I had a daughter and a son were there. And uh, my parents were there at the time that it went off on Christmas night, on where Christmas. you thought you were going to sell down from mm -hmm. a full day's activity. How did that affect your children? Uh, they were small at the time, but I'm sure it has had some effect on them. And you say your mother was there. Was your father home at the time? Do you remember? My father was home because he immediately went out to check on Reverend Shuttlesworth. Mm -hmm. What do you remember after, after the bomb had shattered the windows and had blown the door off the hinges? What was the scene like after that? Oh, naturally, the police showed up after, you know, after it was all over, because they were probably just outside anyway and knew what was going on. So they showed up after it was all over. And Reverend came out saying, we're going to march again tomorrow. Mm. We're going to ride again tomorrow. We're going to march again tomorrow. See, Birmingham really began in 56. So Birmingham had a strong organization before Dr. King came to Birmingham. That was one of the reasons he came to Birmingham, because Birmingham's group was so strong. You mean well, the, already the Alabama Christian Alabama Movement Alabama had Christian already Movement. organized Birmingham prior to SCLC coming right. in. Right. They organized in 56. Right. Now, were you actively involved after you returned home uh, with the mass meetings? Did you attend the mass meetings? Attended all of them that I was in town for, because I was and attended them, and they just gave you more energy to do whatever you needed to do to make things better. Mm. You wanted things to be better. Describe to me what uh, a, a mass meeting was like. For a person that had never been to a meeting, how would you describe uh, that meeting? 
Well, a mass meeting, you basically had people of all denominations and everything there. And you had singing, of course you had praying, and then you had civil rights speakers to talk to you about various things that were going on, to let you know that we don't have to take these things, that God never intended for us to take these things. Take these things like Like what? segregation and all. We had a right for things to be better. It was time for us to stop getting books after they had been used and was old and put out of the white schools and then they'd send them to you. It was time that you could just go sit down if you had the money to buy a meal, that you could just go sit down and buy it. And you you know, too long had we given up our seats on the bus. Did even you ever for have a child. that experience personally that experience of having to give up your seat? Too many times. Too many times. Who did you give your seat up to? Do you remember? Uh, to a white person. It could be a child or a woman or a man. It didn't matter. But even if a child got on, you had to get up and give your seat to that child. Explain how that operated. What well, happened? they had boards that they had up that said colored and white. And they would start out letting you sit up some. And then they, as white I mean, up close to the front. Up closer to the front, and as whites would get on, then they would ask you to move and move the board back farther and farther and farther, and as long as a white would get on, they had to have your seat, and you had to stand up. You paid your money in the front, and you came around to the back door to get on. Were there ever any times that you decided that you were not going to get up? I got up, but I didn't want to get up. Did, were there ever times when any of the other people were asked to, to move and did not move? Most of them, uh, before we start really demonstrating on the buses, would move reluctantly. And I watched them have old people to, older people to move in order to let young people sit down. And that kind of turns your stomach. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I wanted things better for my children mm -hmm. and for myself but mainly for my children. And that is the reason that you were there, you were involved, because you wanted to see these changes taking place. Right, and my father wanted things better for us, so it was just moving down from generation to generation because he wouldn't allow us to go to the fair because you couldn't go to the day they were tearing it down. And he said, children, if you can't go to that day, I don't think you need to go. I don't want you going the day that they're tearing it down. We are human beings, and we need to be treated that way. In the demonstrations, well, prior to the demonstrations, uh, in 1960, there were the sit-in movement started, and it starts in Greensboro, North Carolina, and it spreads around the South. Uh, were you ever involved in any of the sit-ins? Well, it started on my way for one, but was arrested before I could get there. <laughs> Tell me about that. What, what, what was that like? They were just taking you, pushing you in paddy wagons. They knew where we were headed or what we were going to do. Oh, they arrest, arrested you. What, did you? Where did you leave from and where were you headed? When you, we left from 16th Street and, Church. And you were headed to? We're headed trying to get to town. Mm -hmm. But they didn't allow you to get too far. So you were arrested and placed in a paddy wagon. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about, about that arrest? Well, the handcuffs, and uh, there were lots of us arrested. So we just started singing the freedom songs. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they wanted us to be quiet. Now, of course was this, we this was the, your first arrest? Was this the arrest? What, when was that? That was in, in 63? The uh, first arrest was in 63, and the other arrests were after okay. 63. Now, do you know exactly what what day this was that you were arrested? Was this... Um... Now, I know exactly when the 63 arrest was because it was Good Friday, and I was in jail on Easter Sunday, and I was saying, oh, I'm missing my first sunrise service. <laughs> and uh, then we were in jail when they put the dogs and the horses. On the children. Was this the same time that Martin Luther King was arrested? Yes, he was arrested at that time. And as we were going in, he kissed each person on the shoulder, I mean on the cheek going in. Mm -hmm. 
saying it was going to be all right. We went in with him on that time. What were, what were the facilities like? What was it like to be uh, incarcerated? In, well, in you know the food wasn't good. And we had the little cot to sleep on. So it was different. But we didn't major on the conditions of the jail. We majored on what we were there for mm -hmm. to make things better. How did other inmates view you? that were not a part of the, uh, the demonstrations. Some of them were glad we were there. They knew things would eventually get better for them, so some of them were very glad that we were there. Your first arrest, how long were you, were you uh, incarcerated? About four days. And what do you remember about when you were released? Uh, of course, my daddy came and got me. <laughs> I was divorced at the time. Mm -hmm. And my father came and got me. And uh, we went back, and we were right. At that time, we were meeting every night. Mm -hmm. So we were right back at the movement that night. What was the reception when you returned to the movement? Had good reception. Did, did you, at that particular point, um, talk about your experience in jail? There were so many of us. And then, and then added to us were all the children and all the young people that were going on, so they didn't have time to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one talking. Mm -hmm. At the meetings, I've been told that there were Birmingham policemen present. Oh, sure. They wanted to know what was going on. So they were present at all the meetings. What did, did they, where did they sit? What did they, what did they do? Most time they had to stand because there were no seats. <laughs> and uh, they would just be around there till the meeting was over so they could give out that information. I guess Bull Connor had sent them. Were they taking notes? Uh, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. They were taking notes. That was their assignment. But they were at all the meetings. You said you were arrested more than once. Mm -hmm. You were arrested twice or three times. I, I went. I planned to go to jail twice, okay. so that was fine. Uh, the third time I had to go to jail was because we went to court and they didn't have enough money to keep us on the ground. I had a meeting scheduled for Tuscaloosa that night, uh, and we had to go to jail because they didn't have enough money to keep us out. So you're saying that the second time you were arrested, you were released, and then you had to go to court. Mm hmm and then you had to return to jail because the movement could not afford, they didn't have enough money to keep you out of jail. That's right, they didn't have enough money to make bonds for all of us. Why were you arrested the second time? Uh, for the same things, just the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. what, was it, what was it like being a part of the demonstrations? What was that? It was a good feeling to know that you could help make a difference. And, and I would proudly say I had been to jail. Badge of honor. It was a badge of honor. It wasn't anything that was derogatory or that was wrong. I had been in jail for some freedom that we truly deserved. And you mentioned about guards, security guards. Can you tell me what you mean about security guards and who were they and what were they guarding? Uh, these were volunteer people from the movement, some of the board members and some of the members. We had ladies out there as well as men. Dester Brooks was one of the ladies. Uh, Colin Stone Johnson was, was one of the men. John S. Lewis, they, they just had a round. They had a lot of people that would come and volunteer. So it was kind of a good feeling coming home because you never came home without a person out there watching you, so you didn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. and, and they did that. At first, they started out just watching upstairs in the church, and they were watching behind the house. And then after the second bomb, they decided that they needed to close in the front porch so they could have see better because they were watching. And then they, after the first bombing, they moved the parsonage across the street 
uh, they didn't build it back where it was because they had more space across the street than they did there, and they moved it across the street. But watching from there didn't give them what they needed. So then they had people watching from the back of the parsonage, from the back of our house, from upstairs in the church, and from our front porch. And with our house sitting on the corner, it gave a very good view several ways that they could see because they had the glass out there and put a little gas heater out there so that it wouldn't be too cold sitting up because they did this year round. And you said that there were both male and female? Yes. They were, gave time. Were they armed? Uh, I don't think so. But they would they would sit and watch around the clock. Right, for whatever was coming. Was uh, coming. Like one night, my sister had moved back from Chicago, and she was coming in from work, and she discovered the bomb that was moved, that John L. Lewis, that you hear about John L. Lewis moving. She discovered that bomb, and they moved it to an open lot. So they had it right up against the church. It would have tumbled those bricks down. So we didn't get the damage that we would have gotten so, had it not been discovered. So those that were watching removed the bomb from near the church mm -hmm. into a vacant lot. Mm -hmm. And the bomb went off in the vacant lot. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um. They were there to protect Reverend Shuttlesworth. And they did whatever they could do to do that. And we tried to make it, and my mom and my dad and all the family, we tried to make it as pleasant for them as we could to making coffee for them and other things. Mm -hmm. It was an experience because after one, after one incident, uh, they said that my husband and some other guys had, had done something to some men, and they were on uh, on the railroad track, which was behind the house, and some, they had to go to court. You know, I think it was just some trumped up charges. So they had done something to some men? Some white men. Some white I think it was just some trumped up charges. And they had to go to court. Well, I went to court with my husband, and I was pregnant at the time. I carried my child through bombings. Mm -hmm. And when I left court on the 15th of August, my September child was born that next morning at 4.34 a.m. Mm -hmm. So all of the strain and everything, you know, just wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Were there other members of your family that participated, the other brothers and sisters that were involved in the movement? At the meetings and whatever and in the choir, but not, I was the only one to go to jail. Mm -hmm. that you were, a member, were you a member of uh, Bethel? No, I'm a member of St. Luke Saint. AME Church. Oh, okay. That was my mother's membership. Okay. And, and they were a part of the movement, too. They had mass meetings at that church, too. Right. And so we would go from church to church to have the meetings. They would use the larger churches. Right. So mass meetings were held at Bethel and at all, many, churches, many ac churches around the city. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And your father was a member of, of Bethel. Yeah, he was a member of Bethel. He taught Sunday school. He was chairman of the trustee board. He was the BTU director and worked with the children and anything else he could do. What benefits did you, your family, and community realize as a result of the movement? The benefits we realized was I didn't have to give my seat up on the bus anymore. I could go and sit down and eat. If I had the money, I could buy what I wanted to buy and to be able to go into places. Of course, we lost a lot of things also, but we gained the right uh, to work some places that we had never worked. And for some people, they didn't realize the struggle. It gave us the right to be able to vote without taking a long test that was just made up for us to vote. Uh, it gave us the right to go to a school close if we wanted to. 
So where Reverend Shuttlesworth was beat at Phillips, both of all of my children, all three of my children went to Phillips High School. And they were able to go there. And then the children, when they went off to college, they went to UAT in Tuscaloosa and in Jacksonville State. Montevallo, they tested the colleges. Um, made you feel like more like a human being. Although there's so many things that still need to be done, we did gain some things. Do you think that integration was a positive occurrence? Uh, did it have a positive impact upon the black community? Or did it have a negative impact or something in between? Something in between for some is very positive. A lot of those that work to make things better, they haven't received any benefits from it, basically, because maybe they can't afford to go to the hotels or the motels, and they can't afford to go see the plays, and they can't afford to do a lot of things. And for people that were in business, they lost a lot of business because, because people could go other places. They forgot the people, the, the blacks that were in business. So many of the institutions that were established during the segregation era would, in fact, uh, be lost as a result of, end quote, integration. Right. And then the schools certainly was worse because they took most of our best teachers and put them at the white schools. And imagine sending us their worst teachers, majority, that they didn't want. And I think that's where no whipping came in because they didn't want the blacks whipping the white children. And we lost our discipline with the prayer coming out and no discipline in there. That's why that's where we are now with guns and knives and things in the school. So how then would you evaluate um, the, the accomplishments of what has taken place since the movement? Things are better. They are much better. Because as I talk to my granddaughter and I tell her the things we had to do, well, I just wouldn't have done that, grandmother. I said, yes, you would have, because you were back in that time. So things are better for you now. If you want a McDonald's, you can go to McDonald's and get it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to get it. You can even work there if you want to work there. But still... In a lot of instances where they have hired people, you still know it's a black-white thing. They're there because they must be there, but they're going to give the promotions more, and then they're going to a lot of time pay the others more than they pay you for the same job. So you must be better than that white man in order to get that job. They'll bring you in just to have a token in the business, but they're not going to give you a job, one of the better jobs where you can make a decent living. So you would say that we still have a ways to go? We still have a lot of work to do. And people who have quote unquote made it with some good positions feel like they've arrived, but there's much work that needs to be done. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we've not dealt with in relationship to Birmingham, the movement, changes in Birmingham, or anything of that nature? I thank God for the parents that I had that had the foresight to see what needed to be done. Now, my daddy said he never went to jail because he wasn't sure he could let him hit him and not hit him back. <laughs> But uh, I thank God for that, and I thank God, like I said, for being in a civic-minded community who believed in doing things also. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that during the times I went to jail, I was working at that time with Johnson Publishing Company, so I didn't have any problems job-wise as far as what I was doing. Um, but... Um, what did you do for Johnson Publishing Company? I worked in the community relations department with the drive that you see for Ebony Jet 
uh, and all of the magazines where the churches and civic organization makes money for it, and we would give them the silver and all the gifts and everything. So I was working in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida uh, with that. And I just see that we need to come together. I said we, we, we slowed up tremendously when Reverend Shuttlesworth left Birmingham. He was a great leader. And uh, Reverend Gardner was a good follower. But we slowed, but Reverend Shuttlesworth wasn't afraid of anything. He made moves sometime when Dr. King said no, he said yes, because he wasn't afraid. And I watched him put, go and stop the bus and make it turn around and come back and put his children off. I saw that with my eyes. The bus didn't want to put them out where they were supposed to after the buses finally came into the area. And he would go up a couple of blocks and make that bus turn around and bring his children back. School buses or uh, public, public bus. buses? Public bus. How would he make them turn around? He would go up because they should have put them out. And they were so mad they didn't want to put them out. Oh, they would just pass their stop. Pass their stop and carry them somewhere else. And he would make them turn the bus around? And bring them back. I saw that with my eyes. So he wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I admired about him, that he, he had a mission. And see, the movement came, you know how the movement came into being, of course, when they, when they outlawed the NAACP and the movement started. And so it had a mission, and it was busy doing it. But if you were supposed to do something, when I was on trial for the J.B. Stoner case, you know, the judge wanted to know well, what's happening to Reverend Shuttlesworth because the people in Birmingham until the Civil Rights Movement just didn't know nobody but Dr. King. Well, and you, it was you, were, you said that you were on trial for the J.B. Stoner case. Would you explain that? Okay, for that, for that bombing, I, they had called me as a witness. Okay, that was the, the first bombing um, on... Christmas Day. I don't know whether that was the first one or the second one, okay. but he was involved in it, and they had called me. And I was you testified? For a witness. Okay. Did you testify mm -hmm. in that case? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, we just, I am glad, I am very glad. I remember when my daughter wrote a paper to you, Fred Shuttlesworth, the forgotten leader. Uh, when she was in your class. Uh, but I'm just glad that Birmingham, Birmingham knows that it, there was an Alabama Christian movement for human rights with Dr. Fred Shuttlesworth as the leader before Dr. King came to town. Because even young people, 30 years old and back, they knew nothing about it. All they knew was Dr. King. So we had forgotten his history, but his son told me when they came for unveiling the statute. So, well, Robert, you know, I guess I'm glad because I probably wouldn't have had a daddy either because I think some of the stress and the struggle may have caused their mother's death because she had a sudden death. And that was a lot of pressure with husband and children being out there. So he said he guess he's glad they forgot him for a while <laughs> so he could have his daddy. Mm -hmm. As for you know, Junior, I never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. That's... Quite a statement. Mm -hmm. well, Ms. Smith, I want to thank you for taking your time to come and share this information with us. And this will be housed at the Institute, as you well know. Thank you okay. again. Thank you, Dr. Huntley. Thank you. Well, 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 well.